the sky blue, why do I have brown hair? Why do I have two eyes if I only see one thing? <laughs> Hopefully you only see one thing. Uh, why don't crabs have eyebrows? That's an interesting one. Why, why did swear words get invented if we're not allowed to say them? <laughs> As we get older, the why questions change. We contemplate the world around us and our place in it. We wonder if God exists. We think about life and ways, and our questions change, but we still question everything. And somewhere along the way, we come to the most basic question of all. Why are we here? Whole philosophies have sprung out of a quest to answer that very question. And there are all kinds of, of worldly systems and religious systems, sacred systems, that have sought to answer that question and answer it in a, in, in a way, number one, that brings comfort, number two, that gives people answers for what they're seeking, and number three, settles the question once and for all. Uh, they all try and do that. In this study, Why Are We Here?, uh, we're going to look at six of these questions and see what answers the Bible provides. We don't have to struggle to find purpose and meaning in life. The answers are, are, are really right here um, in, in God's Word. God created us um, primarily. This is, the, this is the simple question. Well, let me ask you the question before I get into that. Why are we here? Glenn. Glenn's, wait, wait, Glenn said you did this to us. <laughs> oh, no. Psalm 119.11. Wow. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I could quote it. It is the will of God to have spirit of God use the word of God to make the children of God more like the Son of God. And that's why we're here. I, everybody's done now. Nobody else wants to give an answer. And that's a pretty good one. Uh, and that is true. Um, it is God's will that through the Spirit, He uses His Word to make us, His children, more like His Son. I mean, that is ultimately, that is ultimately why, why we exist. God created us. Um, and why does He want us to be... I'll, I'll do this way, and Glenn's not allowed to answer. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Why does he want us to be more like his son? We are created in his image, and in that image we are able to do what? Fellowship, glorify, reflect, show forth who he is, fulfill our purpose. Our purpose ultimately is to give glory to God, to show God's glory. Not that we have, God has all glory. We can't add to it. There is nothing I do that in any way can be put together with anything you can do that can in any way be bundled up together with all of the best of the good that anybody else can do that somehow will make him more glorious than he is. You know, we get, we get in our minds at the end when God gathers us all together and we take all of those crowns off our heads and put them back at his feet that somehow that's the glorious moment. That's the glorious moment for us, not for him. They were always his. We didn't take them from him, and we didn't create them to give to him. They're all his. So there is nothing we can do to add to the volume or the majesty of God's glory. The only thing that we can do is reflect it, his image. We reflect it, and creation itself reflects it, um, increasingly as it becomes more and more in line with the nature of God, the character of God, the essence of God. So as time goes on and sin continues to run its course and the deterioration, the decomposition of creation because of the curse of sin and death in creation, the further it gets from its ability to reflect that glory untarnished. The more tarnished it becomes, the more dull the reflection is, the less it reflects that glory. If God as creator didn't step in somehow 
and provide a means by which we, in our course of life, could have our direction changed, have our mirror polished, that tarnish somehow cleaned, that we can't clean. It's kind of like my, 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 it's my, it was my mother's, I think it was my great aunt's before that, um, and, and now it's one of my daughters. I, don't, I forget which one has which. But real silver, where? Silverware, silver, cannot clean itself. And you ever notice it can't stay clean? You can seal it in a box, put it away somewhere, wrap it in plastic wrap, and when you pull it out, what happens? It's tarnished. It's dull. We not only can't clean the tarnish off ourselves, we can't prevent the tarnish from coming. We live in sin. The world is cursed with sin. So God, in his grace and his love, reaches out in love instead of required judgment by sending his son, reaching out into our lives, opening our understanding to our state of tarnishness, um, and that's what makes us different from the rest of creation is that we have, we have the opportunity, unlike other spirit beings, angels, we have the opportunity to accept now God's solution to the tarnish. Unlike the animal kingdom who doesn't have the ability to think in terms of of morality. Um, and unlike earth itself, creation, the rest of creation, that has no choice but to wait for Christ to come back. Glenn. So the question is, can we then diminish God's glory? No. I can diminish my reflection of it. Just, just like when the, when the sun hits a mirror and the mirror redirects that sun to somewhere else, you can't, by dirtying that mirror, affect how bright the sun is. But you can affect the reflection of it by making the mirror dirty, throwing dirt on it, painting the mirror. You can make it so the mirror doesn't even reflect. Edie. Yes, we can grieve, um, and that's the tarnishing of it, because then the Holy Spirit, as God, it, who indwells inside of his children, right? Because it, Acts chapter 1, we receive the Holy Spirit uh, when we're saved, and when we receive that gift, that Holy Spirit then, as God dwelling in us, wants us to progress sanctification, progress in our holiness, our set-apartness for God, for his purpose. Uh, and when we hold back from that and we allow the tarnish to remain or even purposely sometimes decide to take upon ourselves the tarnish and roll around in the dirt instead of just trying to refrain from it, um, instead of polishing you know, with what God has given us, the tools he's given us to polish, instead we decide to roll around in the dirt then we're grieving the Holy Spirit because that is, that is contrary to who he is. So it's, and it's a grief that's not, I mean, we've all in this room, in one form or another, gone through times of grief, times of loss, whatever it is, loss of health, lo loss of loved ones, loss of position or power, power, that sounds bad. You, you understand what I mean. We've all gone through times of grief where life didn't turn out the way we thought it would, and we've, we, we've grieved the loss of what we imagined it would be. All right, we've, all, we've all gone through that. Imagine the Holy Spirit who knows what you could be. That's the idea of that grief. All right, We're holding back. We're holding on to the tarnish of the world. We're going to hold on to it because at least at that moment it feels good. And instead we in turn not just frustrate the work that the Holy Spirit otherwise would do, but it causes the Spirit himself to grieve because it's contrary to who he is. It's, a, it's that groaning inside that he then takes to the Lord on our behalf. When scripture talks about it, you know, we talk about those groanings that the Holy Spirit does on our behalf, um, things that we can't understand. Those groanings don't just include the things that, um, that we are praying for relief for, that we don't, under, that, that we don't know how to pray for. Um, it's also groanings 
to, to, to help us to be what, what, what we ought to be. It, it, those groanings are, are the grief that he is taking back to the Lord be, because of what we're going through that he knows we don't have to go through. Make sense? So, many of us go through life without considering the bedrock question of our existence. We're so busy going through the motions of day-to-day living, we never slow down to ask, why am I here? We never stop to consider what God is doing. We never even give in any stretch our sense to eternal things that are going on around us. All we see is what's right before us, what we want to do now, what we need to do tomorrow, what we'd hope to accomplish next week and the month after and the year after and the decade after. We, we, we are so focused in this life rather than in eternal things and eternal glory. People with a completely secular worldview believe that we're here by chance, but God created us with design and purpose. And more and more, the, the secular community is beginning to see at least some of that evidence, design and purpose. They might not know the answers to it, but they see it. When we discover God's intent for our lives, we move from merely existing to truly living, living with purpose. Um, so here's the setting, Genesis 1 introduces the Almighty God. Moses is writing this. Moses wasn't there, right? Like, in the beginning, God created. Was Moses there? No. How did Moses know? God revealed it to him. What's, what, is, what does 2 Peter say? Okay. 2 Peter... Yeah, 2 Timothy 3.16, um, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for in every area of life, okay? Um, 2 Peter, that no Scripture is, um, is uh, able to be interpreted by any private individual. Let's, let's turn to 2 Peter real quick. 120. I kept having the, 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 the number two in my mind. Um, 120, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. It is not open to what I want it to be or what I think is in it, it is important to be. It is not for me to interpret differently than what God meant it to be. Now, I make mistakes, and I have to do retractions at times. And I might go out on a limb, and I might, I, might, uh, I might be dogmatic about something that I shouldn't be dogmatic about. You know? and, and that's why we, you know, Paul says, prove all things, hold fast to what is good. Take, take what you hear, hold it to the light of Scripture. If it's wrong, go back and fix it. If, if you can't fix it, let it go. Hold on to the things that are, are true, okay? Knowing, no prophecy of Scripture is given by any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. Did Moses decide, and this is important, this is really important, um, the, the Apostle Paul movie, I haven't even seen it yet, I've seen the trailer, and the trailer bothered me. Can anybody guess based on this verse why the trailer bothered me? The guy says, I need to find Paul and convince him that he needs to be writing down his memoirs. 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 Memoirs memoirs. I can't say it. Okay, you know what I mean, right? It's not by the will of man. Nobody convinced Paul but God. And he did it here, never came by the will of man, but holy men of God, that is men who were set apart, not men who were completely righteous. Paul was not. Neither was Luke. Neither were any of the apostles or the prophets of the Old Testament. Just read the prophets, and you'll find that out to be true very clearly and very quickly, right? They were men who were set apart by God's choosing. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That word moved is carried or brought along, superintended by the Holy Spirit. So God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, in God's choosing, sends the Spirit to move those men, to pen these words, and then superintends using their personalities, their thoughts. He superintends the perfected and perfect recording of God's word, the Bible. 
Genesis chapter 1, Moses writes, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, everything above and everything below, and anything our minds can consider above and below. You know, we get hung up on, on the heavens uh, in the sky versus the heavens and the stars above the firmament versus heaven itself where God dwells, and our minds think of heaven being up so that God somehow heaven is up and hell is down. And Okay, everything above and everything below. In the beginning, God was there. In the beginning, God created. And he created it. There was nothing else until he created it. Ex nihilo in the Latin, right? Out of nothing. Uh, he created. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The earth was without form. It was empty. And, dark, and how does he create a world that's empty? I, did it have rocks? No, it was empty. I don't know how he created a world that was empty. But then again, there was nothing created at the time. He created something that didn't have any content. He added content. <laughs> like, there was no material as we know it in existence. He created the earth, it was without form, it was void, empty, um, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Darkness is simply the absence of light. There just had not been created yet light. Now, the Bible tells us that God is light, He is the source of light, He created light, but up to this moment, in the void of creation, there was only darkness. Because it's void, there's nothing there. Um, and the Spirit of God, there's the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the face of the waters, um, the subterranean, that which was underneath. And God said, let there be light. And behold, there was light. Before he created the stars, before the sun, God created light, and light was there. In the book of Revelation, in the new heaven and the new earth, it'll say we won't need the sun and the stars for light because God will be the light. Wow. Wow back to creation, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, um, and there was light, and it was good, um, verse 4, and God divided the light from the darkness. He separated the two, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. It's like here's this void earth that he created that has nothing in it, and it was dark, and the Holy Spirit moved over the face of it, and there were waters underneath it, and then God said, like a basketball player, let's spin it. And we're going to have light on one side, dark on the other side, and I'm going to divide them so there's light and dark. He, he did that before he created the stars and put everything else in motion. I, I, it, I, it, it, incredible. All right. So God created the heavens and the earth. He called the, 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 the light day and the darkness he called light and the evening and the morning were the first day. He saw that the light, it was good, um, and God was content with that, with his first day of work. Um, and that evening in the morning that he divided, uh, and we've gone through this in depth, what, a couple years ago, a year and a half ago, two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was, I don't know. I had charts all over the walls. It felt like science class. Um, uh, that... Uh, God, God, God specifically moved Moses to use very specific language here. Hebrew is not a specific language like Greek is. Hebrew is a very conceptual language, but there are still certain rules that must be followed in the Hebrew just like any other language. And when you get to the idea here of a number being attached to the word day in the order in which it was attached in the Hebrew, it can only and was ever only in the Hebrew used to describe a 24-hour day. End of discussion. No evolution, no day-age theory, it's not here. It can't, it, it, it can't be substantiated even grammatically. Even if you took... even even if you wanted to take all of these other theological arguments 
and, and bring them to light. And, uh, you know, a thousand years is about a day, and a day is about a thousand years, and, and which never meant that anyways. Uh, you, you come to this passage, grammatically it can't be supported. Um, and Hebrew is not always that precise, but with this it is. Isn't that interesting? Um, with this it is. So um, that's the first day. Oh, it is. Well, but no, it's, well, no. I'm sorry. Um, it, the, the question is, is it poetry? Uh, it's not part of the, of the poetry or the, the poetic books that we have. Um, there are, there are um, literary devices that are used throughout it that might have inserts of poetry or allegory in certain places. But that doesn't give us the freedom to allegorize everything, just like reading somebody's actual biography that has been vetted out and proven. I don't have the right to just allegorize whatever I want in that because that in no way changes the reality of what that person's life was. The Bible's the same way. I can go to the biography of God, his word, which is really God's biography, and I can read it, and if I choose to start allegorizing everything, just based on my choosing and my whims, um, it doesn't change the fact that God is who God is and who he says he is. It, it's just that now I miss the power of what God is saying and who he is. And I, I, I miss everything he's trying to tell me. So there are literary devices that are used throughout, figures of speech, allegories, things like that. Um, but this is not allegorized at all, if that's a word. I'm sitting in front of an English professor. Anyways. God's first action in creating suitable habitation for life was to give light into, bring light into existence. Because this light did not come from heavenly bodies, such as the sun, moon, or stars, uh, which would be created later. It may have originated from God's presence itself, and the Bible certainly substantiates that. This was not the creation of the glory of God. And that's important for us to remember. Light, I perceive humanly. Light is a result of God's glory. It's not. Light is a result of God's creative act. I have a hard time picturing what is glorious without light. Light is not a byproduct of God's glory. It is an act of His creation. Imagine... We are, we are so limited in our perception visually, in our hearing, in our taste, in our smells. When we get to the new heaven and the new earth, um, and old things are passed away, Second Peter, he's melted it down, he's reformed it, and it's all new, and we live for eternity in what God intended for us to experience in his glory. I can't, I have a difficult time perceiving God's glory as something outside of the light he created. His glory is so significant and will be so overpowering to me that when I exit out of this linear creative history into his eternal presence, I will be ushered out of, out, out of the, the limitations of created light into the direct beam of his glory that light can't even stand up to because it was only through his glory that light was created the power of his glory so it's not just a simple byproduct of his glory it is the exercise of his glory's power in creating it Whew. so not created glory of God. Rather, this light may be a reflection of his glory and a reminder of his presence. The image of God's light and his glory is found throughout the Bible. Israel's wilderness travels during the exodus from Egypt. God's glory was evident in the tabernacle, Exodus 40. The psalmist stated that God covers thyself with light as with a garment, Psalm 104, verse 2. In the New Testament, God's glory will provide all um, the only light needed by humanity, Isaiah 60, Revelation 22. Uh, note that God's creative activity happened instantly as a result of his authoritative word. That's important for First Peter this morning. 
Remember that. The power of His Word brought all into existence. Keep that in mind for 1 Peter as well this morning. And God said, and there was. And it was so. A reminder of the authority and power of the Creator. He had in mind a perfect image of what He wanted, and that perfect reality came to exist simply by His speaking. He said it, it was so. But even the light itself was created as a reflection of his glory. Not as part of it. It just reflected it. So everything, all the colors, all the beauty, all the things we do see, all the things we do hear, all the things we do taste that are all wonderful things, the smells that we smell that, that are wonderful smells, not my dirty socks, you know, all the beautiful things that we can think of that are the most beautiful things we can think of, are still only a minute, sin-tarnished fraction of what I will see and perceive when I see directly God's glory. Is it any wonder? Turn with me. 1 John, keep your fingers in Genesis. Right? Let's go back and forth, beginning to end. 1 John. Chapter 3, verse 1. What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. By the way, the word behold um, is probably not supposed to be here. It's not asking us to perceive it. It's emphatic. There's a difference. One is, hey, look and see if you can see. The other one is, let me tell you what is. All right? What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God? Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. At this point, in all of God's biography, the revealing of God in His Word, the revealing of God in the beauty of creation and the wonder of life and existence, it has not yet been revealed to us what we will be. And let me, let me just say this. When we ask the question is, why are we here? We are here for what we will be and what God is going to make us and what He does make us through Christ, all right? We are not what we shall be. But we know when he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Uh, Back to Genesis. Here's the thing. When I perceive the direct shining of God's glory, it is... For me, in the righteousness of Christ, because God has saved me by His grace, His choosing through faith, when I see His glory directly, not a reflection, and it is perfect, not tarnished, it will be so powerful that I can't help but at that moment be fully like Him. That's power. He won't have to, at that moment, transform me. His glory will. It just will happen. I I won't be able to help myself because I'll see him as he is. Not through these human eyes that are finite and limited and tarnished. And I will see his real glory. And light and the sunshine and the rainbow will be like, Eh, you're all right. It's like a cup of coffee in the morning. (laughs) It's more precious to some than others, (laughs) right? It'll be like nothing. I'll be so overwhelmed by the reality of who he is. So I can take this book and I can change all these words and I can add things like different theories that humanity has come up with over the years and everything else. Bottom line is, I can't change God's biography. 
It is what it is. And his biography says he created us to be perfect. What happened? Genesis chapter 3, sin entered in. Even before that, get to Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God, um, uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth. Who has to, at this point, question our origin? It's there. We can change it. We can say it's evolution. We can say that it took billions of years. We can, we can do all of those things, but it doesn't change the reality of God's biography that doesn't allow for any of that. God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it. He rested from all of it. This is the history of the heavens and the earth. Verse 4, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to fill the ground, um, to till the ground. But mist went up from the earth, watered the whole face of the ground, and the Lord God then formed as- Yasa. That is, God formed man of the dust of the ground, Adam and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being because God breathed it into him. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward of the Garden of Eden. He planted man whom he had formed, and all those things happened. Uh, and the Lord saw that it was good. Uh, he created Adam, Adama. He created woman. Um, Adam said in verse 23, This is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. Have you ever thought about why does it say a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife? I'll let you chew on that one. Um, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Complete, full innocence. Sin not experienced. God existed before there was a universe. God created the heavens and the earth. God created heaven and earth simply by speaking them into existence. God created order, separating light from darkness. God showed his authority by naming portions of his creation, day and night and animals and plants and stars and moon um, and man and, and woman, all of those things. He made man in their image, in in his likeness, God's image and likeness. Uh, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. We were to have dominion. Talk about purpose. It is our job to be a caretaker of the creation God gave us that reflects his glory. And the more we damage it, the less it reflects. But that includes, that's not a naturalist tree-hugging thing. The more that I don't take care of this creation and don't have dominion over this creation, the more I tarnish it and it doesn't reflect God's glory. I have a purpose to reflect God's glory, period. Scholars have long debated what God's images includes, what God's image includes as we are created in his image. Among various suggestions are that it could refer to elements of character, personality, reasoning, morality, responsibility, special qualities appointed um, the role of humans to rule over the earth as well. No other parts of creation had the aspects of morality, reasoning, responsibility, and rule. Other parts of creation had the responsibility to reflect God's glory. It groans, Romans, right? Waiting for the time of redemption so that it can once again fulfill its purpose. All of those things happen. We are made in the image of God. People are made to rule um, over animals and the earth as well. I don't have time to do all these things, so I'm just scrolling um, and trying to give you some of my highlights. What does the creation story teach us about God? Or what does the creation story teach us about us? What it teaches us about God 
is that his glory is so significant that it exists outside of all that we perceive in creation itself. And it alone and the proximity of it. Remember Moses' face? A reflection of God's glory as God with his very hand covered Moses from his glory. So there was just a reflection of God's glory passing by him and just a portion of that glory reflecting. Moses was so adversely affected by it that he put a veil on his face for fear that the level of that glory's reflection on his face might strike Israel dead in their sins. And yet somehow we forget that when we exit outside of this created narrative that he has created and enter into his eternal presence, that somehow we already have an idea of what he's going to look like. He's only given us a fraction of it. But it is so immense that when we stand in his presence, we will at that moment have everything from us removed that doesn't line up with who he is. Everything taken away, the judgment seat of Christ, right? That doesn't perfectly reflect his glory. And we will finally, 1 John 3, be like him, for we will see him fully. What does it teach us about who God is? He is more than I can ever understand. What does it teach me about who I am? It just makes me want. Once I begin to perceive, not the actual glory, but my inability to understand it, or live it, or interact with it, or reflect it the way I was supposed to. No wonder God made us so longing to understand our purpose because we can't in sin fulfill it. That's what he's taught us about us. Kathy was right in the very beginning. He created us to fellowship with him as perfect created beings. And until we stand in his presence and see him fully, we have been redeemed eternally. It has been concluded in heaven at the judgment seat. God has already determined our innocence. But humanly speaking, in this finite existence, until I stand before him, I will always be frustrated in the sense of not being able to fulfill my purpose. I should never be satisfied. with who I am in Christ. Because the very best of all that Christendom could ever be that I don't even come close to being is not even a fraction of the full glory of God himself. And if it wasn't for Christ, I would be of all men miserable, hopeless, lost. And I only know Christ because of his choosing and his touching my heart with my sin. Why am I here? To fellowship with a holy God. Then why are we in this mess? That's what we look at next week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your biography, the revealing of yourself in the pages of Scripture. Thank you, Lord, for giving us an understanding as limited as our understanding is of our purpose here. Lord, help us to never forget the power and the immensity of your glory and the wake and void of our existence in attempting to reflect it. And yet the wonder of your love shown for us in the act 
of your giving of your Son and the work of your Spirit to bring us back to fellowship with you and the desire you have for us to experience in part in a glass dimly lit the joy of your salvation until that day that our faith becomes sight and we enjoy it fully. Keep us ever humble, ever rejoicing, always grateful, slow to judge, quick to hear, always ready to redirect according to your biography as you wrote it. We commit even this day to you, we pray in Jesus' name.